Hello, folks. Welcome to Byzantium and Friends. I'm going to start today by reading you a passage, uh, just a paragraph long. It's from a 4th century author, a famous theologian, Gregory of Nyssa. He was the brother of St. Basil of Caesarea, who kind of became the model bishop in the Byzantine imagination. And Gregory of Nyssa was a very accomplished theologian, philosopher. Uh, he was uh, in Constantinople. Uh, where one of their friends, Gregor Nazianzus, was the patriarch. Briefly, he stepped down. And what was happening in Constantinople, the reason why they were all there, is that the Emperor Theodosius I had convened a council, uh, later to go down as the Second Ecumenical Council, to decide on matters of theology, and specifically in order to uh, impose Theodosius' uh, Western-derived sort of Nicene version of Christianity on the Eastern Church. The question being debated at the time was the exact relationship between the Father and the Son and what would be conceptualized as the Trinity, and specifically, you know, whether the Son is sort of the same with the Father or in some ways inferior to the Father. The group of people who had been arguing the latter position, that there is this kind of distinction and that in some way the Son is sort of subordinate to the Father, though how you define that varied, are called in modern literature Arians, uh, from an early 4th century priest in Alexandria, Arius, who had uh, held forth on that kind of position. It, there were lots of variations of this. We don't need to get into them. And there's this council going on in Constantinople, which at the time was this vast construction site. The emperor had just moved in. And Gregory of Nyssa is writing this theological work, arguing against one of the so-called Arians. And he's going around the city, and he gives us an impression of the kinds of interactions and encounters that he had with various people. And here's what he says. You know who I mean. The whole city is full of them. The alleys, the markets, the squares, and the wards those who deal in apparel, who change money, who sell us our food. If you ask about a sale, he will philosophize to you about the begotten and the unbegotten. If you inquire about the price of bread, he will answer that the father is greater and the son lesser. And if you say, is the bath ready, he will assert that the son comes from non-being. I don't know what to call this evil, an inflammation of the brain or a mania or some other illness that destabilizes the mind. Now, this passage is famous. Uh, I would call it infamous. It's been used again and again to characterize the Byzantine mind in the totality of its historical existence across all social classes. Because look here, all the bath attendants and people selling you bread are lecturing you on theology and talking about the begotten and the unbegotten and who comes from non-being and so forth. And Gibbon used this passage. Many, many historians use this passage to say, well, this is what the Byzantines were really into. This is what characterizes their uh, whole civilization, their whole culture. And this um, approach has, you know, disseminated far outside, you know, the, the realm of scholarship. Uh, I, I, I fellow graduate, uh, fellow student in graduate school who was working on a completely different field, told me that he had once flirted with Byzantium, but was lost interest in it when he realized that this is what the whole civilization is about, people arguing theology in the streets. Now, this passage has been misused. <laughs> this is not what's going on in Gregory of Nyssa. Uh, it is a choice on the part of modern historians to use this passage this way. There are, in fact, many other passages from other church writers whom we could use that present a very, very different picture of the relationship between, you know, masses of people, uh, you know, common folk, you know, simple believers and theology. Uh, look no further than John Chrysostom, who again and again and again tells us that his congregation had no idea about the fundamentals of Christian belief, and I, like one passage in particular where he goes on about how if you ask ordinary Christians about the names of the horses who race in the Hippodrome, they'll tell you all the names and who won which race and all of that, but if you ask them to name more than like two apostles, they can't do that. 
And yet, we take the passage of Gregory of Nyssa to be indicative of the essence of the civilization and not all of those other passages that indicate the exact opposite. What's going on in this passage? Well, it's quite straightforward if you read it in context. As I said, this is a treatise about arguing against um, I think Eunomius, who's one of these Arian theologians, and the whole point of the passage is to stigmatize people who have Arian beliefs as lower class, as kind of uneducated, as people who shouldn't be expressing opinions about these things. That's what it's all about, because all of the opinions expressed here are Arian opinions. So Gregory of Nyssa, like Basil of Caesarea and Gregory of Nazianzus, were these local aristocrats from Cappadocia. And they looked down on these people, who included Eunomius and his teacher, Aetius, uh, who were kind of these, well, it's hard to know, you know, what class position anybody occupies in this society, but uh, they attacked Aetius and Eunomius as being kind of lower class people who managed to get an education and, and talk theology, and they shouldn't have. They were, um, you know, out of their lane, as it were. So this is just a, a theological version of class prejudice being used for polemic, uh, we should not be using this passage as indicative of social realities. My guest today is Jack Tanus, uh, who's a professor of history at Princeton University, and he has written the book uh, which makes the case for the view of Byzantine society that we get from like the passage of John Chrysostom that I mentioned. Uh, which is that most people, most ordinary Christians, you know, average, simple believers, as he calls them in the book, uh, they did not identify their faith uh, or practice their religion in these hyper-intellectualized ways that we associate with Byzantine theology, but that their attachments uh, came from, uh, you know, other, you know, directions from, you know, family and local tradition and practice and going to church and the things that one does and the relationships that one forms, and that they were very often ignorant, in fact, indifferent to the more sort of highfalutin, stratospheric kind of theological discussions that we tend to associate with the culture. And, and I, I think he's right, and that this extends straight through the whole of uh, Byzantine civilization for as long as it existed. The book is called The Making of the Medieval Middle East, Religion, Society, and Simple Believers, um, and it is, it's large and it's very footnoted. It looks like an academic monograph and all that. It is, however, very accessible. It's very clearly written. Um, and Jack also makes available here a perspective from Syriac sources, which is something that one doesn't find that often, though he mixes it also with the, the Greek patristic sources as well and social history and hagiography and so on. And from all these different directions, he pulls together a picture of the religious life of what he calls simple believers, and actually extends the argument from late antiquity into early Islam. Um, so looking at the whole Eastern Mediterranean, um, Greek, uh, Syriac, Arabic traditions, and develops a similar kind of argument about early Islam um, at the end of the book, and has these fascinating um, discussions of what happens when Christian simple believers meet Muslim simple believers, <laughs> and neither have, you know, particularly interested in the um, the high theology, and but they engage uh, much more uh, interpersonally on a level of practice. Anyway, I found it a fun fun read actually. Um, so uh, thank you to Medievalist.net for reposting these episodes. Uh, here is my discussion with Jack Tanus. Hello, Jack. Welcome to the podcast. Good to be here. Thanks for having me, Anthony. So all the words in your title. Uh, would be familiar to most of the audience, the making of the medieval Middle East, religion, society, and simple believers, except perhaps for the simple believers. Uh, so this is a new concept uh, for most people. So tell us, who were the simple believers and what makes their religious lives simple and simple in comparison to whom? That's a great question. So for me, I actually got the phrase simple believers from the sources themselves. And I sort of spent a lot of time reading through, especially Syriac, which is this dialect of Aramaic, which was a lingua franca for Christians throughout the Middle East religiously for centuries. I originally encountered it in Syriac texts, but once you're sort of aware of it, you sort of, you start seeing it. It's everywhere in Syriac, but it's also everywhere in Greek. Um, and it's a phrase that's used by church leaders to re refer to what you might call the 99%. It's just basically everybody. Uh, it's all the folks out there who aren't sophisticated 
sort of professional Christians, people who can't read, people who can't write, or maybe people who can read and write, uh, but who don't spend their lives studying theology, just everyday, ordinary Christians. And so most people listening to this podcast would probably be simple believers uh, by the estimation of a late antique or a medieval church leader. So it's, it's basically everybody, but the, but the theological elite. Right. So you suggest in the book that the framework by which we study the history of religion in, in this period in late antiquity, and I, I imagine the same is true for most of the Middle Ages and antiquity as well, that we construct these frameworks based on the writings and the experiences and, you know, even the biases of um, people who were not simple believers, uh, right, who were very well educated and who could write sophisticated prose and who, you know, drew on ancient literature and these kinds of, and that that skews the framework. So how would it change our view of that history if we were to sort of foreground the experience of simple believers rather than sort of theologians and people who are mentioned often in the sources as sort of important historical individuals. I think it would make it a, um, a lot messier. And I think at some level, make it a lot less alienating, if that makes any sense. What I, what I mean by alienating, I think that um, when we approach, I don't want to use the word we and you know, assume anything about everybody listening to this, but when people approach, I think the late antique and the medieval periods, they often feel like it's an age of spirituality where sort of everybody's wearing robes and everybody is holy and everybody has got it all figured out religiously. Um, uh, and that's in part because of what has survived uh, from these periods, uh, the texts that have survived. Um, and, you know, I once I recently saw an image used in a book uh, uh, of the inverted pyramid. Like you have a little bit of evidence and you build a huge sort of structure uh, based on that, that small bit of evidence, right? And mm. so people project based on the texts that we have and assume that, that those texts speak for the religious experience of everybody living in that time. But again, imagine if all that survived in terms of American uh, cooking in the 21st century were cookbooks written by the best chefs in New York and Los Angeles right. and I don't know what. And we assume that that was what it meant to cook and eat food in the United States in the 21st century. Look, you know, a lot of folks are having sloppy joes every night for dinner and they're eating, you know, microwave food. They're, they're buying they're buying stuff at Costco and making prepaid meals from whatever, from Kroger or whatever. Right. And so and there's a relationship between what what the people in the fancy uh, five star, three star Michelin places in San Francisco are eating and what folks are eating from Costco, the, the take home food they're getting. There's a relationship there. Um, uh, but it's not, uh, one is not representative of the other, right? One might be a much more highly refined version of that. Mm. Uh, 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 but it's, what's, we take people as being representative who are, aren't representative at all, who are in some ways the least representative. And I think it's a very interesting question. How, how do the people who aren't representative relate to those who are, if that makes any sense. And I think investigating that makes so it, when you realize that this is not a world of people, everybody there is sort of holy and got it figured out and sort of can see the, you know, the sapphire light of the Holy Trinity, you can engage in prayer like Evagrius of Pontus, this great spiritual master, and everybody's seen the sapphire light every day. Um, it makes it seem like somehow yet more human and more familiar. I know it's a dangerous to say that because as they say, you know, the past is a foreign country, you won't find yourself there. So it's different than us, from our period but in different ways than what we might expect. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, so the cooking analogy is pretty interesting. And so let's explore that a little bit more. Uh, if the texts that we have, uh, sort of stratospheric level theological you know, discussions are, these, are very esoteric stuff. You mentioned Evagrius, yeah. who gets dragged into discussions of postmodern thought and so forth, right? Um, if that's gourmet cooking or highly specialized cuisine, so what is the meat and potatoes um, fare that simple believers uh, eat? So like, what is the religious life of a simple believer consist of for the most part? So I think, so it's important, I think, to realize that this is a world of one which is maybe 90% illiterate, um, in which books aren't widely available. Um, you know, you might have to kill 30 or 50 or 100 animals, goats or cows to, to have enough enough parchment to make one manuscript mm. right these are expensive things you can go to any hotel room in this country in the united states and get a bible right there's a gideon's bible you can get it off the internet right there aren't whole copies that many whole they're called pandex there aren't many entire copies of the, of, 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 of bible, copies of the entire bible floating around in our world right so this is a world which is largely illiterate it's largely rural like maybe 90 percent of people are living in the countryside they're working as farmers um, um, so 
I've I've forgotten your question now, but like, uh, yeah, what is the religious life of a simple believer? Oh, so what religious do they life. Do so or... it, yeah. So I'm sorry, I lost my my train of thought. So this fine. is a world in which people are largely illiterate, and so your spirituality, if you want to use that word, is not one that's mediated through text necessarily, right? And so I think what it means to be a Christian in this period is to attend the liturgy, to attend church. Um, uh, uh, if you have a church that it's available to you, um, your what it means to be a Christian might be to venerate a certain saint. Uh, to be a Christian uh, uh, will be to take part in the liturgical cycle of the church throughout the year and to have your sort of worldview informed by that and to see your life in the context of the story of Christianity that's told in the liturgy. Uh, at the center of this life is the Eucharist. Uh, at the Eucharist, there's a story told of Jesus of Nazareth dying for your sins and, and rising from the dead. And sort of, I think it's, it's heavily Eucharistic, it's heavily sacramental, uh, and it's heavily involved with the liturgy. Uh, and any sort of account of Christian existence or Christian life in this period, late antique and middle ages, has to, I think, account for the fact that it's largely literate, largely rural, uh, and, and people's encounter with Christianity would, would have been oral, I, things they hear at the church. And the question becomes, you're only as good as, you know, the sort of the priest leading the liturgy. So where are the, where are the priests trained? Uh, and that's, that's another question I tried to get up in the book, but uh, it, it's a largely illiterate world. So what, is, what, is a, what does religion look like in, a, in an illiterate context? Um, and it's, I think it's very hard for people today, it's certainly hard for me, I'll speak for myself, to imagine that in a, in a sort of a preprint pre world, uh, in a, in a pre-literate or largely illiterate, illiterate world. Yeah, and I imagine it would be difficult for many people who knew the basic story uh, from what they hear in church to reconstruct, like, when all of this happened exactly. Like, are, are we a few generations out from Jesus? Are we a couple centuries out? Like, and you, you, you would ask and you would, you would hear something about, you know, when Quirinius was governor of Syria and like, when is that exactly? Or something, you know, I can imagine a great deal of uh, confusion about these kinds of things. And those are the base, that's the basic story. Right, like so, forget you know, in two natures or of two natures or you know wh whatever that may be, um, and right, we can imagine people who go to church for Easter, maybe some other major festival, and we can imagine people who go more regularly. I mean, there's probably a spectrum right of, of engagement there, but that's the problem. And these people doesn't don't leave us sources where they lay all of their confusion and their, sim their simplicity out, right? So, so how do we reconstruct, how do we access um, what those, even the mental world or the, the world of lived practice of a simple believer is? So that's another really good question. So almost by definition, uh, simple believers aren't leaving sort of memoirs of the, their religious life was. They're just trying to make it through every day. It's like everybody today, they're trying to make it through each day. So the way I try to access simple believers is by reading as many different kinds of sources as possible. You read things like hagiography, I, accounts of the lives of saints. Mm. Um, and in, the, in these sorts of accounts, you can we can have a debate about whether they're true or not. And for me and for my purposes, it's not really doesn't really matter uh, if this particular saint went to this particular town in this particular time. Sort of if you will take these sort of stories as being as reflecting sort of the expectations of the world in which they're produced. That's good enough for me. You read saints lives, you read letters, you read church councils, the canons, the sort of the, the, the disciplinary um, uh, stipulations that come out of church councils, these meetings of church leaders. Um, you read uh, 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 responsa, sort of letters. If someone writes to a bishop and says, can you do X, Y, and Z? He says, no. Or he says, uh, you know, has, has, this person's doing X. Is that okay? No. <laughs> so you yes. sort of read I you remember, across, it, yes, Go wasn't there a case where someone wrote to Augustine and says, is, is it okay if I put a death spell on this person? And he says, no, 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 that's not okay. See, all of the, that, that precisely that sort of thing where like people write into uh, leaders and they sort of phone a friend, if you will. Um, and those are moments where you sort of see simple believers and their ideas sort of poking their heads into the, into the, into the literate world, if you will. Right. And so if you read across all of these different genres, historical chronicles, basically everything you get your hands on. Uh, I think you can you can try to form, get an image of sort of what's going on and what are some of the, some of the concerns of these people, uh, which is again the concerns of everybody. It's things about can I have a baby? I got I got locusts and mice in my field. Um, I'm worried about the rain. It's sort of my kid is sick. Uh, all these sorts of things. It's sort of the, the things that people approach a holy man, sort of a Christian. Uh, a person who's sort of seen as being in touch with with God in a special way and might have special powers, 
in a, in a saint's life, you'll see people approach holy men and ask them, can you help me with X, Y, and Z? And those sorts of questions point you to the, the sort of concerns that people might have. Um, uh, and so if you read across uh, different genres and different texts over a period of time, I think you can sort of start getting ideas uh, about what are some of the re religious concerns of everyday people in this world. And again, back to the food analogy, these concerns aren't necessarily divorced from the concerns of the elite. It's not sort of like a, there's people in a seminar room who are debating, you know, uh, the price of tea in China or whatever, economic theory, and then everybody outside doesn't care. There's a relationship there uh, between what people debate um, and, and what people on, on the ground think. In the same way that, you know, what you go and buy at Costco uh, might be a little bit simpler view, uh, version of what you're, they're selling at you know, the French Laundry or whatever some fancy restaurant is in California, right? There's some kind of relationship there. Um, uh, and I think it's interesting to explore that relationship, how sort of the higher level discourse itself grows out of everyday concerns. I think it's a very interesting and very potentially productive uh, path to take in scholarship. And I'm not the first person to suggest that. That's been around for a long time. But anyways, I think that's interesting. No, but let me just say, I mean, for the for the audience that you do a wonderful job of excavating the experiences and the, you know, the, the, the anxieties and the problems of simple believers from all of these texts. I mean, in your book, it's a long book, uh, but it's, it's, no, it, I, I never, I didn't feel that it was a long book. It's very immersive. Uh, so you use the sources in these wonderful ways to kind of get you, get, get us, the readers, right, into the problems of these people. Um, and you have to go through these for the most part, elite, you know, sources that are written by, you know, that are church leaders, this kind of thing. Um, and you do a great job. I mean, I felt like I was really being immersed in that world. And we have to read those sources right? like you do, like what we sometimes call against the grain. Right. So there's this bias, I think, on the part of, you know, people in our position to sympathize more or to side with, you know, people who are like us, uh, scholarly types, people who, you know, deal in abstract concepts and, you know, and to assume that their version of Christianity is normative, even for that world, and, and to treat everything that doesn't conform as a deviation or something that we can overlook. But reading it against the grain is like, no, they're talking about simple believers, because those are the majority of people around them. And that might be the normative in terms of the just the, the center of gravity of Christian society at that time. It might be them, not the seminar, you know, groups that we kind of instinctively affiliate with, you know. I think that's 100 percent true. I think, look, certainly I, I, you know, did a master's degree at Oxford and I studied patristics there, uh, among other things. I studied Eastern Christianity and I studied some Greek patristics there. And I sort of developed one uh, uh, sort of understanding, and this is not Oxford's fault, this is just my own uh, poor, uh, you know, uh, ability to make, to reason, uh, of how this world must have been. Right? You read Athanasius, you read Cyril, these sort of towering figures from the fourth and fifth century. Um, and you think that uh, uh, late antiquity is filled with people who are the equivalent of a great professor of patristics sort of running around and having these debates. Um, and I, I, so my father's from Lebanon and I went to Lebanon in 2006 and I met my dad's, my dad, a bunch of my dad's family there. Um, and I remember I met my dad's great aunt who's now passed away and she's a beautiful, amazing person. And she was illiterate. She was a refugee in 1948 from Palestine. Uh, she couldn't, uh, she couldn't read. She's very smart. And I remember I had this talk with her. And so her, one of her brothers, her little brother had become a Baptist in Lebanon in the 1960s. And she was, she confided, she was very worried about him, she told me, um, because he wouldn't cross himself. And she didn't think he was a Christian because he wouldn't cross himself, like, like a good Orthodox Christian would. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, and, uh, and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> and I realized, I was like, what if someone like my great aunt, uh, what if her sort of religiosity. I mean, I had a big debate with her about astrology. She was like into astrology. She'd watch this astrologer room around the TV in, in Beirut. And I was like, that's not a Christian. She's like, I'm a Christian. And like, I was like, that's not a Christian thing to do. Right. And so what if, I was like, well, wait a second, what if someone like my great aunt, what if she is more typical of late antiquity than a great, than a great patristic scholar is? What if there are more people like her who can't read or write, who see themselves as Orthodox Christians, she would every morning, she couldn't really walk very well. So she, you know, on Sunday morning, she'd watch um, a Maronite mass and my family are Orthodox. And I was like, what are you watching a Maronite mass for? You're Orthodox. That is a matter. Christ is one. 
right? And so there's sort of everyday, there's a sort of everyday tolerance, or I don't know what the right word is for that, but a, a pragmatism about these things. That was, again, if you've, if you've been trained to read sort of theological texts and think about confessions and boundaries and sort of boundary maintenance, uh, it was struck me as being very, you know, this is not the way it should be. But then I had this moment, I was like, wait a second, what if there's a lot of people like her in my period? Um, and when I started thinking that way, I started seeing it everywhere. And I realized that the people we read Athanasius or Cyril, or you name it, you name any great, you know, father of the church, uh, they are related to simple believers. They live in monasteries or are are, are are through their pastoral capacity. They're first and foremost not theologians, they're pastors. They've got to get their flock across the finish line. So they're dealing with people who are largely illiterate, who think that if you don't cross yourself, you're not a Christian, uh, who, who will have a, a pragmatism about uh, things like the Eucharist and Eucharistic boundaries and et cetera, et cetera. My father, his parents took a vow. They wanted to have a, a, a son uh, and they had, had they, and they, so they, they went and took a vow to St. Joseph. Again, they're Orthodox. The Orthodox don't have St. Joseph. So they went to a Maronite church and took a vow to St. Joseph, right? Um, and that's a very pragmatic thing to do. Uh, they went to a church in Beirut somewhere, right? It's a very pragmatic thing to do. And so once you start thinking about the people, even the elite theologians in three-dimensional terms about what, what was their day-to-day -day life like, you realize they are the children probably of simple believers because mm -hmm. priests couldn't, uh, bishops couldn't have kids. They said they, should, they, right. they shouldn't have kids. They're related to brothers and sisters who are simple believers and their flocks are filled with simple believers. And a big part of their life is protecting those people from bad, from theolo theological bad guys, guys with black hats. Christian and non, and getting those folks across the finish line. And so understanding our, the figures that we as scholars tend to read and love to read in the context of a sea of invisible, uh, simple believers, I think helps make the, this, this universe much more three-dimensional, much more interesting, and much more human. It's like, I'm not a physicist, but right, they say dark matter. Most of the universe is made of dark matter. Yes. Right? But in order to understand uh, all the laws of nature, you've got to assume that, that the dark matter is there. Simple believers of the dark matter of the, of the late ancient and, and medieval world. To understand our people, yeah. you've got to see them in a sea of simple believers. And yeah, so that, for me, it gives a, a, a third dimension to, or it goes like going from black and white going to color. Yeah, that's another good uh, analogy. Um, I'm, so you, you know how in the interdisciplinary study of religions, you know, there often this complaint is voiced that there's this, it, you know, in, in, in the modern Western study of religious history, there's this kind of bias in favor of what's called a Protestant view of religion, which was like all about how, how deep and profound your individual faith is, like something like that. Um, and, so, you know, sometimes when we're talking about late antiquity, this comes down to confessional issues, like Christian identity is, you know, are you for or against Chalcedon, um, which is a concern, like the, the Council of Chalcedon, that's just, that say that this is about a theological a problem on which many church leaders disagreed. And uh, obviously they had many followers who you know, created sort of social movements for and against certain theological formulas. But if you look outside those groups, you, you kind of wonder whether you know, that is an appropriate framework for understanding their Christian identity. And it, like, is it a matter of confessional belief and association uh, or uh, sorry, affiliation? And in these discussions, it often comes up, you know, there's sometimes a faculty member who's from a, a Catholic country. Um, <laughs> one, one case I can think about is, is Spain, for example, where, you know, Catholic Christianity in those countries is like about the festival. It is like primarily about like the festival of, of the Saints Day. And, you know, you're getting the costume ready and the, the float, you know, they have all these magnificent parades with you on the horse and you, you, everybody's involved in preparing all of this. And like, that's the religious experience. And, you know, and I've, I've been to these villages, they never talk about any sort of theological or abstract issues. It's, it's about the group getting together to put on the best parade. Yeah. So like Chalcedon. So, I mean, I don't know how deep into Christian theology your, your, your listeners are, but it's this big council in 451. It's a gathering of church leaders in 451. Um, and, and they, they try to put forward, uh, they put forward uh, an understanding, it's called the definition of Chalcedon, of how uh, the human and the divine relate to one another in the person of Christ. 
Um, and it becomes sort of authoritative for uh, the Protestant, the, the, the Roman Catholic, and the uh, Greek Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox tradition, to which, um, you know, the Russian Orthodox Church is part of that, the Greek Orthodox Church is part of that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, I call it the Humpty Dumpty moment of the ancient church. It's a moment which splits the church apart, yeah. and all the king's horses and all the king's men can't put the church back together again. Roman emperors spend the next two centuries or more trying to fix the splits that come out of Chalcedon. Yeah. Um, large parts of the Church of Egypt and the Church of Syria reject it. Um, the Ethiopian Church is not Chalcedonian. The Armenian Church is not Chalcedonian. So in the period, huge parts of the Christian world reject this, 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 this council. And to a modern reader, when you see the debate, is Christ in two natures or out of two natures? It's sort of, it's, you know, ek versus in in Greek. It can be quite confusing. And I think, um, I think it was confusing to people back in the day. And I think that the debate they're having there is an important one, and it's a profound one. I, I'm not trying to sort of, as they say in Britain, slag it off and say it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that if you look at sort of, again, the background conditions and the world in which people are living and moving and having their being, so to speak, most folks don't have the education uh, or uh, the training. Let's say you could be a highly literate person even, but if you've not been trained in a certain discourse, a certain sort of tr tradition of how to understand it. So like, Anthony, you have a PhD. But I don't know if you are, maybe you are qualified to go and judge between string theory versus I don't know what theory in physics. Just, just being educated doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're qualified to sort of operate at the highest levels in a right. certain defined area of discourse. So you can be a super educated person, but not understand sort of the theological stakes in this debate of Chalcedon. So it's a really interesting question, historically speaking. How does the Ro late Roman world split apart over a council, which most of the people probably can't really evaluate. They don't have the books needed to actually go and read the church fathers and see what's being said. They don't have the, they haven't been trained in theology and philosophy to understand sort of the nature in terms of the debate. How does that happen? It's, it's really interesting. It's like a question of people might look back. I tell students sometimes look back a thousand years from now in late 20, 20th and early 21st century America, and they'd be amazed at um, how people get so worked up over issues of constitutional hermeneutics, yeah. right? You know, are you, do you believe in a, in a living constitution? Are you an originalist? Are you a textualist? Like there's articles in the paper about this hermeneutics. How do people get so worked up over hermeneutics? But you and I know, cause we live in this country uh, that these questions can be proxies for larger questions and right. sort of a, in the context of a cultural war that's going on in this, in this country the past however many years. Right. And so I think one helpful way to think about Chalcedon is there is a it's a proxy for there, there are different sort of systems of devotion going on, sort of different attitudes towards the, towards the Eucharist. This is an idea that someone like uh, a very famous church historian called Henry Chadwick put forth in 1951. Right, there's different views of the Eucharist involved, but let's even go more to a different level. Why would a villager in Syria? Why would a villager in Egypt? Why would a villager in Palestine uh, go for or against Chalcedon? Right, that's the question. So I think it's the answer to that. Several things. Like first question is, what's your local priest doing? Because you do whatever the guy, your, your local, your local church. This is a world. My, my teacher's a man named Peter Brown, and he once told me he said, "This is a world in which people, churches don't have parking lots, right?" So in America, you don't like your church. You get in your car, you drive to a different one. Yeah, I want to go to a service that's got guitars and not pianos. I'm going to it's got organs and not guitars or pianos. You can get whatever flavor you want. It's like more than Baskin Robbins in, in this country. You can go, you know, there's five hundred thousand flavors here, right? But in our world, in this late antique and medieval period, you might have one option. It's, it's a local church. You go to it whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. So then the question becomes, why is the local, the, lo the local church, why is the local priest doing this? Okay, let's ask the question, what's the local monastery doing? What are the folks at the local monastery doing? So there's, a, there's an anecdote uh, in Cyril Scythopolis. He's a, he's a writer in Palestine, let's say, in the 5th or 6th century or whatever. And uh, it, actually, this is it's an anecdote from the 5th century. And so... Uh, someone comes back uh, to a monastery uh, who had been at Chalcedon, and he, and he brings with him sort of the Chalcedonian definition. And they give it to a, a local holy man, and he reads through, he says, this, this, is, this is the way to go. This is, this, this is right. And so because the holy man, sort of the, the big guy, he gives thumbs up, they all go, they all go with it. Mm. Right? So you might follow what's going on at your local church. And your church might follow what's going on at your monastery. Or let's say I go to a monastery. There's a certain monastery I go to because my son is in that monastery because they've got a, it's a holy man there. There's an icon there that I like or, you know, or whatever. For whatever, you're sort of connected to it at a devotional level. If the monks at that monastery are for Chalcedon or against it, uh, you'll probably be for it or against it. And again, not because you've sort of studied 
and believe that the interpretation of Severus of Antioch uh, is better than that of Leontius of Byzantium or whatever, right? Or Leontius of Jerusalem. Right. Some people actually will do that. I'm not trying, I'm saying, I'm, but I think many people won't. And I think it's unrealistic to think, think that they do. And I think if we imagine our world as purely one in which people are engaged in very high level theological debate, um, uh, we're missing a lot. And we also miss the fact that there are different ways of debating Chalcedon, right? And so we think, yeah, I'm gonna throw some proof text at you, Anthony. You're gonna throw some proof text back at me. I'm gonna falsify some proof text to help me beat you. <laughs> all this stuff happens. There's forgery, there's all sorts of stuff. But there's also a thing where, look, Anthony, let's, let's just let's, let's start a fire right now, okay? And I'm gonna get a fire going to my village. And I believe in Chalcedon and you don't. Let's put our hands in the fire. Let's put your money where your, where your mouth is. So there's still, you know, you put your hand in the fire. I put my hand in the fire. My hand doesn't burn. I'm right. Your, your, your hand is in really bad shape. You, know, you got a bandage on it, right? You're right. I'm wrong. Or let's, let's, you write a statement of faith. I write a statement of faith. I'll throw my faith in the statement of faith in the fire. You throw your statement of faith in the fire. Mine doesn't burn. I'm right, right? There's stories like this related oh, to yeah. things. So these sorts of stories are circulated. Now, do they happen or not? As they say in Arabic, Allahu alam, God knows best. I don't know, <laughs> right? But um, uh, but these sorts of stories can circulate uh, and they can serve to buttress one side versus the other, right? And then the question becomes, let's say Anthony's a very holy man, but he belongs to a heretical church, right? I want to have a baby. I want my wife to have a baby. I don't care. Like if my if my kid is sick, I don't care if my doctor is a Christian or a Jew or an atheist or a Muslim or they're Hindu or they're whatever. You take your kid to the doctor because your kid is sick. Like if Anthony's a holy man, he belongs to a radical church and my kid is sick or I want to have a baby or whatever. I'll go talk to Anthony. I don't care. This is what happens. And so you see sort of questions from the early Islamic period about Muslims going to Christian holy men. There's a sort of ecumenical approach, a sort of pragmatism out there that I think that focusing solely on doctrinal controversy misses. Now, I'm not trying to like, again, diminish the importance of the, th of the theology or the doctrine. I'm just saying we need, it's good to have a, th a three-dimensional approach saying this yeah, is part yeah. of a spectrum of engagement with these things. And to only focus on the doctrine misses the human experience of the great mass of people in our time, in our time period. And again, we've, it, it makes, I think many people today feel very alienated from these, this period because they're like, look, I'm a crappy Christian. I'm a crappy Muslim. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bad Muslim because I don't, I don't have the, the, the horsepower under my hood to figure this stuff out. I'm somehow deficient. But so I think bringing a sort of a simple believer's perspective in gives us a third dimension, which makes this period more human. And I think more interesting. Yeah, I remember a similar story from, I think it's John Rufus, the uh, Peter Fortius, right? Where there's this yes, woman who it. travels to another town and she goes to church and she, you know, going all through the service. And it's not until the priest, I think, recites the creed that the church uh, accepted there that she realizes that, wait, this is pro-Chalcedon? <laughs> like at the very end, it's like, oh, holy cow, I got to get out of here. Uh, but until then, there was like no per perceptible difference. Um, I mean, one of the things that happens over the course of our period, over the course of the late Roman, late antique period, is that the churches gradually find way, they, they develop ways to differentiate themselves from one another. It could be mm -hmm. the way that people dress. It, one of the most important ways is, again, I think that what it means to be a Christian in our period is primarily through the liturgy. You, you encounter Christianity and the Christian story through the liturgy, right? If it mean, if being a Christian means you, you sort of make God's story, your story, you see yourself in the context of, uh, of the story of salvation history of how God, the God of Israel, it relates to the world. And you see yourself in that. You learn that story through the liturgy, right? And there are certain sort of cues that happen in the liturgy, which will signify to you whether or not what kind of church you're in. Mm -hmm. So the most famous probably being what's called the Trisagion, like this, this, the holy, mighty, holy, whatever, uh, who was crucified. At, at the end of it, it's Ostarothis Dimas, right? Who was mm -hmm. crucified for us or not. If you have a longer or shorter version, that tells you, uh, uh, Agios Iskiros, Agios Athanatos, Agios Otheos, right? Uh, at the, if you say who was crucified for us at the end, you're in one church or another. Yeah. Right? And so when you mess with the liturgy, you're messing with sort of the life, but you touch the quick of what it means to be uh, a Christian in our world. And so it's, it's. I think, is it St. Augustine has, there's a line somewhere where uh, they, they switch out, I guess, the, the Vedas Latina, the old Latin version of, of, of whatever it was they're reading in the lectionary reading for the for Jerome's Vulgate, and people get really upset about it, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, uh, they, they're used to a different, a different sort of reading. 
So when you mess with the liturgy, you're messing with people's sort of lived experience of Christianity. Um, and it's at, at the level of liturgy that I think that, that, that that's one of the most important ways of differentiating. Also, whom you pray for. Are you praying for Bishop Anthony, the Holy, Holy Saint Bishop Anthony? Are you praying for, you know, the heretical Bishop Jack, right? <laughs> you know, and so, and so when you put people in or out uh, of those people you're praying for, or when you walk into, it's really hard to tell it. If you walk into a late antique church, the ruins of a late antique church, you can't tell if it was Miaphysite, i.e. a group that rejected the Council of Chalcedon. You can't, or if it was Chalcedonia, a group that accepted Chalcedon. Yeah. Uh, one way you can tell, the one church I've been into, you can actually tell, it's the Red Monastery in Upper Egypt. You walk in there, they've got Dioscorus. They've got certain people on the wall who tell you immediately, 100%. It's like if I walk into a house and people are wearing red MAGA hats, I know they're, they're pro-Trump, yeah, right? Exactly. And so I walk in a church and I see, you know, they got, you know, I walk in a house and there's a, a car parked out front and there's got, you know, Hillary Clinton bumper stickers on the car. Or they've got like a Joe Biden sign in the front line. I know these people are, are pro-Democrat, right? In the same way I see Dioscorus on the wall in the church. I know these people are pro, they're anti-Chalcedonian, right? So it's visual cues and also then the aural cues in the liturgy that help tell you this. Um, but these, these sort of ways of differentiating have to develop over time. Yeah, and you talk a lot in the book about um, the church leaders and um, you know bishops and priests, and especially in their homilies, who are frustrated. They're just constantly frustrated that they can't impart you know their theological uh, thinking to their congregations uh, at you know directly and and successfully. Um, obviously, anyone who's read the homilies of John Chrysostom knows you know that he's. <laughs> He's constantly frustrated. One of my favorite lines is where he says that, you know, that, that, there, that there are people in this church today who can name the horses that are racing in the Hippodrome tomorrow, but they can't name more than two apostles. Yeah. Um, so why, let's stand back from that frustration for a moment, because the Christian movement was otherwise spectacularly successful, right, at converting the Roman Empire at, you know, you know, uh, persuading or getting the majority of the population to take on a Christian identity and, and over time, sincerely so. And this was, a, I think, a pretty massive project that was very successful in terms of communication. Um, so where did it kind of run into its limits that, that, that after a certain point, you, okay, you've gotten all of these people to uh, they're on board with the Christian project. They are believing Christians. But at some point, the ability of the Christian leadership to, you know, move them theologically or define them, right, in terms of their confessional identity kind of runs into a, a sand patch, right? So um, why does that happen? So I think that like the Christian message, again, if you have you know, a very in a very basic level, it's it's a very easy message to understand. Again, it's an account of the activity of the God of Israel in the, in this world, right? Jesus is his son. Jesus comes to earth, dies for your sins, raised from the dead. That's what's been proclaimed at the Eucharist. I mean, Yaroslav Pelikan, the great historian at Yale, said this every day for the past two thousand years. There's been a Eucharist celebrated, and at the Eucharist, that basic message is is is, is commemorated and, and expressed. That's a very easy message to understand. And it's a very easy message to see yourself in light of. I think that the, the sort of the roadblock, the sand patch is, is when you start uh, sort of the, the more uh, sort of educational requirement or training, you know, it's used, I'm going to debate Anthony about, again, is Christ in one nature or two? That debate there to have that requires a certain level of sort of pre-knowledge and a certain level of education, uh, theological education, not just education, but theological education. And that's a tough, that's a really tough sort of ask or a big ask or a tough pull to make, mm. you know, in a world before print, uh, in a world before mass education, even in a world with mass education, just go to a pew on any Sunday in any church in this country and quiz people. Christianity Today, I think, is a, a, a sort of a well-known evangelical magazine. I think every year does a, does a, a poll about uh, you know, our, our favorite heresies. They ask, they ask Christians and the, people who are really engaged with the Christian faith, you know, do you agree with this statement? And they, people will agree in very high numbers with statements that were condemned at the Council of Nicaea. Jesus is the, is the, most, is the most important, highest of God's created beings, right? Yeah. That's sort of like Christianity 101. Jesus is, 
you know, he's a human being, but he's also pre-existent and uncreated, right? And so if in the United States, the wealthiest country in the history of the world, very high levels of literacy, everybody goes to school here in theory, right? Um, uh, that's the case. How much more would, would, the, would, the, would the case be yeah. in a world in which people, and not everybody goes to school, in which not everybody has, uh, in which there is no gender equality. It's not even, it's not an ideal in our world, right? And half of our world will be women, over half, 51% or whatever, you know? Um, so I think the basic story of Christianity is a very easy story uh, to figure out or to understand. Yeah. And I think that, uh, that accounts, I think, for uh, uh, how you can have a widespread adoption of it. But the more specialized you get uh, in the debates, the more it presumes uh, 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 or requires higher levels of education, it becomes very difficult. And I think it's not until you basically get printing and Calvinists uh, that you'll get societies which have really, really high rates of theological literacy. I mean, there's literacy and there's theological literacy, right? So you can have a highly literate society, but it can still be from the perspective of sort of mastering the Christian discourse or discussion about way of talking about God in the world, it can be theologically illiterate, right? And it's, there's only certain societies, I think, in human history, like maybe colonial New England and maybe Scotland at a certain point, I don't know where else. Uh, and they've almost all been Calvinist, thoroughly Calvinist, uh, where you'll have very high levels of not just literacy, but also theological literacy. And I think it's not possible to have that in the pre-modern world, given the constraints of just economy and society. Um, and so I think that uh, the frustration you see among certain church leaders about, you know, certain priests giving communion to heretics uh, or, or, you know, people from our church taking part in the funeral procession from some from that church or about having, you know, people from a rival church, a notionally rival church, and my kind of staying in my monastery uh, and living as monks in my monastery. All those frustrations, I think, are in part a function uh, of the constraints this world sort of operates in. It's a constraint that uh, Jewish leaders would face, Muslim leaders would face, and Christian leaders would face, and leaders of any, Manichaean leaders would face, mm -hmm. leaders of any religion would face th these constraints. And so, anyways, I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I think that imagining a world in which not everybody can read or not everybody can have access to books in which a theological library might not be anywhere near where you're living. And if there, even if there were one, you wouldn't have time to go there and sit and study and read. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. Also, I sometimes suspect that there is a kind of cognitive structural difference between, you know, the basic story that you said is very uh, easy to convey and which everyone recognizes happened at some point in the past and the, the figures involved in it that you hear about, like the New Testament are kind of, yeah, I, I, I don't want to use, I mean, I don't use the term mythos in any kind of, you know, derogatory sense, but it's like the, it's the canon story uh, with all the so heroic characters and they're all in the past. And the conflicts that you're now being asked to take sides in are about bishops disagreeing today, right? And your side treated Flavian badly. No, your side treated Dioscorus badly. And when it gets down into that kind of, and there's a lot of mudslinging, right? Like that's going on in real time. Uh, I think a lot of people find that difficult to, in that period, right, find that a very, very difficult to process and actually not even very central to their concerns. It's difficult to navigate, I think. And I think, you know, part of one of the challenges, I think, of, of reconciliation between the churches in our, in our period is once you have persecuted my church, Bishop right. Anthony, and you've made martyrs in my church or you've done bad things to people in my church, like it's really hard to bury the hatchet. Mm. Um, and if me joining back with your church means I have to sort of anathematize people I regard as holy people that, you know, I loved or my grandparents loved or people we, we might pray to as saints. That's hard. That's a big ask. I can't, it's, it's hard for me to do that. And I think that one of the big, you know, you know, once upon a time, I remember I'm old enough to remember when, you know, every new Republican sort of candidate uh, would be trying to try to grab the mantle of Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. Or every Democratic candidate would try to have the mantle of FDR or LBJ or whatever, right? And so this battle of the legacy of these great leaders and their parties past, right? In the same way, there's Cyril of Alexandria, a figure like Cyril. And so both Chalcedonians and non-Chalcedonians want to claim the mantle of Cyril. 
Uh, and so part of the dispute between these people, it's not a dispute about one nature or two, it's a dispute about who's more Cyrillian. And the so-called one nature slogan of, of, uh, of the people who are against Chalcedon, which confesses that Christ uh, existed in two natures, uh, the one nature slogan was something that they got from Cyril. Uh, and, and so Chalcedon was seen as violating Cyril's uh, affirmation. There's one nature of God, the word incarnate. Why does Cyril have that? Cyril has that because he gets it from Athanasius. Again, another sort of towering figure. And so this idea of loyalty to certain, certain people who were great figures of the past becomes important. So it, it, uh, loyalty, as much as any sort of theological consideration, uh, is, is part of, yeah. of, of this question. Now, one of the ironies of the one, one nature slogan of Cyril by Athanasius is it's it's the allegation is that actually that text that it comes from that's that, that attributed to Athanasius was actually an Apollinarian f f forgery. Yes. Right. So one of the great sort of scandals or tragedies uh, of our period is this the slogan which helps split the church. You know, it's if it actually was a, a forgery, it was actually written by a person who's you know a famous heretic from the fourth century. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the church split over over a over a a slogan was, was, was pinned by a heretic or, or yeah. one of his followers. The, I would go soft on Apollinaris. I mean, I, I think I'm he's not, try, trying to solve a legitimate problem in his own time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I listen. I'm not. I, I don't use the words heresy. That, that shouldn't apply in any of my own personal judgments. I'm just saying, speaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. From, no. The, from the Nicene tradition. Yeah, I mean, he himself was pro Nicene till the end of his life, and then yeah. he sort of at the end sort of fell out of favor. But yeah, I'm not anti. I'm anti. I love everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Apollinaris in particular is, I think, someone who did not set out to cause trouble. But wait, he was like, wait, I'm a heretic now? <laughs> yeah. Sort that of, happened yeah, a lot. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so let's uh, switch topics a little bit now. Um, I want to bring out another element in your book. So why do you focus so much on Syriac sources? And it's not a problem, but you, you, you bring out a lot of Syriac sources um, in your exploration of the lives of simple believers. So uh, how, why was that helpful? Why'd you do that? So, I mean, the, the people have written reviews in my book and I, I usually get zinged for the title, which has the Middle East in the title. And they would, it's, it's kind of about the Middle East, but really it's about, mostly about Syria. Really? Uh, it, yeah, I, I've, gotten, I've gotten zinged for this in a number of reviews. And the truth of the matter is, is my original title, which I now forget, had the word Syria in the title. <laughs> But the publisher wanted to put Middle East in the title. And so it was really supposed to be about mostly about Syria, but the Middle East you know, focusing on Syria. Why Syriac? Well, I mean, the truth of the matter is I just love the Syriac language. I think it's a very interesting language. It's part of, partly it's autobiographical. My father's from Lebanon. My family is from up and down the, uh, the Levantine coast. I was interested in Syria and the transformation mm -hmm. of that region in our period and trying mm -hmm. to make sense of like Lebanon and Syria and, uh, and Palestine slash Israel have a sort of unique confessional blend, which is it's, it has a sort of a mixture of very ancient churches, uh, which are historic, sort of have historically been rivals and necessarily always rivals, but it, they have a sort of a rival that goes back a long time, which makes it very interesting and trying to understand that world um, and then how the Christians of that world responded to um, Islam. It's been, a, it's a, for, for personal reasons, it's been very, very uh interesting for me. Uh, and so I love Syriac and I just read a whole bunch of Syriac and re relatively speaking, this, this, this Syriac material, uh, there's a lot of, it hasn't been worked through. So I read through a lot of things in, in manuscript mm -hmm. and, and trying to take what's in Syriac and integrate that with sort of existing narratives as, as they've been written, which have been based you know, more on like say Greek and Latin sources and trying to bring a, a new body of relatively speaking, undigested material or less digested material uh, into conversation with larger narratives. And so I'm interested in Syria because I'm interested in Sy Syria because I'm interested in Syria. And I was interested in just looking at uh, stuff that hadn't really been soil that hadn't been tilled yet. And so part of the whole thing comes out of my reading of a guy called Jacob of Edessa. He's this guy who dies in 708. He's a, a brilliant polymath. I think probably also a difficult figure. Um, and he was a bishop. And I read through all of his, his you know, we're going to call his canonical responses, these sort of letters people wrote to him. And they said, can I do this? He always says no. But if you read through his letters, um, it opens up a whole world to you of sort of everyday religious practices. And he's very angry about what, what people are doing and that people aren't enforcing the canons. And there's all kinds of so-called boundary crossing going on. Or people from this church are yeah. doing stuff in that church. And at one point in his, in his career, he's Bishop of Odessa, this is a very important city in northern Mesopotamia. It's sort of like the Chicago to Antioch, New York. It's the second city of, of northern Syria. 
uh, he quits his job. He goes and confronts the patriarch and says, you guys aren't enforcing the, the rule, the canon rules in this church. And the, and the bishops, the patriarch says, go along with the times. So Jacob quits his job, takes the book of canon law in front of the monastery and burns it and walks off. And so I, I read through Jacob's canons. I read through a lot of them in, in, in manuscript. And I was like, this is an amazing world. And having gone through Jacob's canons, I started reading through other texts from the period. I read, I read through this life of a guy called Theodota who dies in 698. I went to Jerusalem and I, I photographed this, this saint's life. I photographed an 18th century Arabic translation of the early 8th century Syriac original. Um, but although it, done from a 12th century Syriac manuscript, whatever. And it was done in a language called Karshuni, which is Arabic, but written in the Syriac script. And I read through it. And I was like, man, the, the stuff you see in Theodota, it's straight out of Jacob's canons. Right. And so you see like sort of like these two sources sort of meeting. And I, I, was, I tried to through Jacob and Theodota and through a whole bunch of other sources, try to get a sense for in three dimensions. What does the, the religious world of late antique and early Islamic Syria look like? What does it mean to be an everyday Christian, a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker on the ground in this world of religious diversity, of Christian pluralism, of Muslims around? What does it mean? How do people navigate this? And, 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 and what's going on? And so that was sort of Syriac, so it's partly autobiographical, partly I fell into these certain sources, which I thought were really fascinating, which had been pretty much unused by most scholars. I mean, a few people talked about them, but they hadn't been, I think that there was a lot of Jews to be squeezed sure, out. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, I'm very glad you did that. Uh, because, you know, we can access a sort of thicker description that way of uh, life in Syria, which um, sometimes don't get that much from the Greek texts. Um, anyway, so you mentioned Muslims. Um, are yeah. there Muslim simple believers? I mean, I think, <laughs> as with Christians, I think most Muslims are simple believers. And I think that you know, there's a whole huge debate about um, the nature of early Islamic history and are the sure. sources reliable. And I wasn't really terribly interested in that debate in this book. I think it's, it's you know, it's been done. It's being done. In some ways, I think it's at a stalemate. It's like the Western, you know, it's the Western front in 1918. No one's gaining any ground. Yeah. Um, and I, I want to sort of go beyond that and have a, have a different discussion. And I think if you accept the view that the broad outlines of early Islamic history are reliable, Muhammad existed, claimed to be a prophet, lived in Western Arabia. Sure. Um, for me, part of that story is that most people in Muhammad's uh, community convert to Islam at the end of his career, right? When he goes from Mecca to Medina, there's maybe 100 people in his community. When he conquers uh, 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 Mecca from Medina, like around the year 630, he's maybe 10,000 people in his army. Uh, the, the year, say, six, around the year 630 is called Amr food in Arabic, the year of the delegations, and all these tribes convert to Islam in mass. You know, if Anthony comes to me and can, you know, comes to uh, somebody and converts to, you know, whatever, converts to a new religion on behalf of his entire, on behalf of Columbus, what does Columbus know about this new religion if Anthony converts on behalf of him, right? So most early Muslims, and the prophet dies two years later, so most early Muslims uh, uh, are Muslim uh, as a result of, of mass conversion. Uh, and, and they conquer the world. And so I think there's an assumption out there, again, in Christian Muslim studies, often an assumption uh, that sort of the Christian Muslim encounter is an encounter between sort of the maximally informed Christian mm. and the maximally informed mm, Muslim, yeah. sort of like high information Christian, high information Muslim. And certainly that happens. But my interest is, in what about sort of what we call low information voters, right? Low information Christians and low information Muslims. What happens when they meet, right? Um, and there's must have been any number of low information encounters. Yeah, that to me is very interesting. And so I think that again, just looking at and same way, if you look at the sort of the broad structural outlines, what are the sort of the preconditions? What are the parameters of our world? You know, ninety percent illiterate, mostly agrarian. You can't really get books that easily. Again, if you look at the sort of the parameters of what the early Islamic world is going to look like, mo not that many Muslims, most are the descendants of people converted en masse. You know, early caliphs have to send sort of Muslims out to evangelize Muslims, to teach them mm. about what Islam actually is. That's the world in which early Christian Muslim encounters happen. And then someone might convert to Islam. What do they, what do they ditch from their Christianity when they become a Muslim? You, actually, you can become a Muslim in our world and do a lot of things that are still Christian. You know, we have a, a Syriac, uh, you know, a medieval uh, uh, Syriac text in which, which gives you a, a service for how to baptize Muslim babies. 
and you give them not the not a trinitarian baptism because muslims aren't trinitarian but you give them the baptism of john the baptist mm-hmm. and sort of in the history of christian salvation john the baptist is operating before the trinity has been fully revealed right so it's a non-trinitarian baptism <laughs> Right. And so Muslims get their babies baptized or Muslims will go to Christian holy men or Muslims will marry Christians. And Jacob Odessa talks about this. What do you do? He's asked the question, what do you do if, about a Muslim man who's threatening to kill a Christian priest if the, if the priest won't let his, his Christian, the Muslim's Christian wife take the Eucharist? Oh, man. Yeah. You just reminded me. So yeah. I'm writing a history of Byzantium and I've reached the 14th century. But you reminded me that in the 13th century, so the Seljuk Turk rulers of uh, Anatolia, Many of them were baptized. Yeah. And even one of the sultans, he fled, you know, because of Mongols, he fled to Constantinople. And for the life of them, this is a patriarch in Constantinople and the court and all, could not figure out whether this guy was like really a Christian or not. Like he was going to a Sophia. He claimed he'd been baptized, but there were people who had no idea what where to classify this guy. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's anyway, I I, I what you're saying resonates exactly. So if you look at later periods, like in Anatolia or in the Balkans, in places with sort of similar sort of dynamics, you've got Muslims uh, in the context of a, a sea of, of Christians. Uh, uh, it's this, this stuff, stuff is not uncommon. And you see it in Syriac sources. You see it much better in later Greek sources or Ottoman sources or whatever, Byzantine mm-hmm. sources. But there are traces of it also in this early period. We don't have as many texts. Yeah. But my assumption, and I could be totally wrong, uh, is that uh, very similar dynamics are at play in, in, in this period. Um, again, because it's a world of simple believers. And so, you know, the people we're dealing with, uh, we're studying, haven't had the luxury of taking a world religions course and having it all laid out for them. This is what this is what a good Muslim believes. This is what a good Christian believes. And this is how this is how it should be. They don't they haven't had that luxury. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and there's a, a sort of a, a pragmatism, a religious pragmatism among Christians with regard, I think, to other Christian commissions and also in the Christian Muslim uh, context. And I think that, you know, as as important as any sort of debate about the Trinity or about the incarnation uh, and the Christian Muslim encounter, the easiest answer uh, uh, for if I'm a Muslim the, the debating Christians, well, look, if God likes you, why do we kick your butts in battle? Yeah, I tell students, I tell students like you know, Muslims are like the Dallas Cowboys or New England Patriots or New York Yankees or whatever of the Middle Ages. They win. They're always winning in battle. They're always beating the Christians in battle. And we have a ninth century. Uh, and I, I don't know if there's Yankee fans out there or whatever. We're going to take take it. I mean, I'm not I'm not a part. Of, I kind of actually am from Houston. I like the Astros, but I'm, how do I get people angry at me? But like, um, uh, especially those Cleveland, Cleveland fans here, whatever. Um, but it. You know, there's a ninth century Arab, Christian Arabic text, and uh, you know it's it's a, a critique of Islam. It's a, you know it's a polemical text, but it talks about you know people convert to Islam so they can glory in the power of the Muslim Empire. Mm. It's like, oh, you're just a Yankees fan because you want to you want you don't because you want to be on uh, root for a winner, right? That's a, it's Christian bishop, you know, or not bishop. I don't know who he is. It's some kind of educated Christian writing this thing, but that's that's a very easy argument. That's a much easier argument than you know uh, the Trinity is this, the Trinity is not that, or Muhammad's this. We have this also in the Christian context, Anastasia of Sinai. He dies around the year 700, let's say. He says, look, if you're debating with a, you know, a, a non-Calcedonian, so-called heretic, a non-Calcedonian, just ask him, you know, uh, uh, why is God, who, who has the holy places? We have the holy places. God has given us the, we control the holy sepulcher, right? God, that, that's, a, that's a better argument. That's a much easier to understand argument than one nature versus two. Yeah. So I, I think in the Christian Muslim encounter, that sort of stuff can, can, you know, that's that's simple believers meeting each other. Oh, absolutely. Now, I'm not a sports person, but um, it strikes me as intuitively true that if you're going to support a team, it should be the best team. And the best team is the one that wins. <laughs> I don't understand why people pick and support teams that don't win. And, you know, if someone asks you what team do you support, it's like, well, I'll, let me wait till the game is over. <laughs> Well, listen, there's a, there's a, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, a, a line in, you know, one of the sort of biographies of the prophet Muhammad uh, about how like the sort of the, the pagans were sort of watching, sort of the tribes of Arabia were watching uh, 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 to see who would sort of triumph uh, yeah. in the prophet's conflict with the, with the pagans of Mecca, right? Uh, and, you know, once they, what do you call it? Uh, uh, once it became clear that Muhammad had, you know, was hegemonic, 
they they came in right. I, with, I came with the Arabic is like well, and they came into the into the into the what do you call it into the religion of God in droves, right? In batches yeah. or in droves, whatever. So once it becomes clear that Muhammad's the winner, that's who God's in favor. That's, that's he's got God on his side. Right? Yeah. And it, it's a very powerful. You know, this is in the fourth century. Anthony was really well better than I do. That's a theology of victory. That's the kind of thing Constantine is all yeah, about. Yeah, that's exactly. what this is all about. But it's a dangerous game to play because you play that, it works in the fourth century. But what happens when Muslims start kicking your butt in the seventh? Right. right? So you, you yeah, go, yeah. you can get burned by that really quickly if you play that game. It only works as long as you're winning. <laughs> well, Jack, I think that's a great place to bring this to a close. Uh, okay. Religious pragmatism. and <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, literally from Constantine to Muhammad, you know, who wins? Um, th thank you very much, both for writing the book and for this discussion. Um, I had a lot of fun reading the book. I, it, it's, it's very accessible. Um, and, uh, and, and thanks for coming on the podcast. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Anthony.